Um, and speaking of hosting, I'm now very excited to turn it over uh, as a host to my dear friend, Rabbi Eliav Bach, who is the um, director, CEO, I can't remember what we're calling you, founding director of Ramah in the Rockies, definitely the coolest Ramah there is. Um, and once there's running water, I'll be there to visit. So Rabbi Eliav Bach, I will turn it over to you for the next section and let you uh, introduce your next teacher. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. I'm wearing a uh, swag, but that's only because everything I own says Ramah on it. And I'm sitting in a basement and we turned off our heat because it was so beautiful, but the basement is freezing. So I'm delighted to um, uh, introduce a uh, friend of Ramah, uh, who I first actually uh, met at Camp Ramah in New England many, many years ago, learning by the uh, Amiya Gum, Rabbi Gordon Tucker, who is the former senior rabbi of Temple Israel Center in White Plains, New York. Since September 2020, he served as the Vice Chancellor for Religious Life and Engagement at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. So, Rabbi Tucker, take it away. Okay, thank you, Eliav, and uh, thanks to everyone who is, uh, who is here uh, participating and advance uh, Chag Sameach to everyone. Uh, so Pesach is the Festival of Freedom, and the goal of this presentation is to argue that Shavuot should be seen as also being a festival of freedom. In fact, it morphed from being something quite different. Um, as you know, Chag HaKatsir, um, really a celebration of a harvest, which it became again in secular kibbutzim. It morphed from that to being a festival of freedom, but it's freedom of a different kind. And uh, arguably, it is the most important freedom that is perhaps needed by the world at large today. So what I consider to be some essential background is to consider the meaning, before we consider the meaning of the holiday, to consider the meaning of the transition from the first of these festivals to the second. That, of course, is the period of the Omer that we are concluding in just a few hours. What's the meaning of that period? Well, there have been lots of interpretations. I want us to look at just two of them, two of the interpretations that have been given for it. So the first is, uh, is well known. It's that of Maimonides uh, in his Guide for the Perplexed. And it's his famous explanation grow that grows out of seeing Shavuot, not as Chag HaKatsir, but as Man Matan Toratenu, <coughs> the time in which the Torah was given. So if we could please share the, uh, the texts here so that we have the first text up on the screen. There we go. So, um, as I said, this is uh, pretty well known. The festival of weeks is the day of the giving of the Torah. In order to glorify and exalt that day, the days are counted from the first of the festivals up to it, as is done, here comes the important clause, by one who waits for the coming of the human being he loves best and counts the days and the hours. This is the reason for the counting of the Omer from the day when they first le left Egypt, till the day of the giving of the Torah, which was the purpose and the end of their leaving. I brought you to me, which is, of course, in tomorrow morning's Torah reading from Exodus 19. Uh, we, can, uh, we can stop the screen share for a few moments, if uh, please. Thank you. Um, so here, what we just read, the count is directly connected to its endpoint, to the teleological goal of it all. It's not the only not the only reason that we count things in our lives, but this is one of the reasons. The goal of it all was, in this point of view, Shavuot as the celebration of receiving Torah. And the desire to experience that revelation was so intense, according to Rambam, that in the days leading up to that great moment, the days were counted. The days of Sfirat HaOmer, in other words, in this point of view, those days in and of themselves are discounted as having no special or intrinsic significance in themselves other than the fact that they are a countdown to the tilas, to the ultimate objective. Their days being crossed off the calendar in increasingly excited anticipation of the one thing that is of intrinsic importance, which is yet to come, but is surely coming. I am certain that we have all had many occasions to teach this text. I have, 
uh, to teach its understanding of what Shavuot ultimately became. And in some ways, it's among what we might call one of, one of the signature ideas of Judaism, that the freedom of Passover is not complete until we are bound by the law. But there is another interpretation of these days of counting that I want to bring to you. It also grows out of seeing Shavuot as man matan toratenu. But as you will see, it is quite different. I have loved this particular take on the days of counting for many years now. Um, and I come back to it myself year after year because of that. Um, some of you who are listening here may have heard me already talk about this at some point. Uh, but I have come in more recent days to recognize its limitations as much as I love it. So those limitations I will get to presently, but right now I want to present this to you and extol its assets before we get to its limitations. So it, it's a teaching from Rabbi uh, Avram Mordechai Alter. He was the son of the Sfas Emes. He was a 20th century scion of the uh, Gerard Hasidic dynasty. And he conveyed a very different understanding of the counting of the Omer. And he did so in the name in part of his father and, and some other people that he, uh, that he quotes, including Isaac Luria, as you will see. <coughs> so if we uh, please could go back to the screen share and just, there we are, Avram Mordechai of Ger. So here's what he writes. In Rai Rai Isaac Luria's writings, it is stated that just as the growth of the grain happens in these two months, basically Nisan and Yar, or middle of Nisan to, uh, to the festival in the early part of Sivan, that's when the grain grows, that's when the soul grows. And it's concerning these days that it is written, I remember the faithfulness of your youth. Nu'urayach. For these days of the Omer preceded the Israelites receiving the Torah. Now for Rambam, preceding the, the receiving of the Torah means these are particularly important days. Now he is saying the fact that it preceded the Israelites receiving the Torah makes them extremely important days. It was only after that that they sinned. And thus the days that we count are the days that precede sin, which came only after the receiving of the Torah. Now even though Israel eventually sinned, there already was, despite that, a residue in each person of that which existed prior to the sin. It is that residue that provides strength for everyone's future, since we are always able to draw on those innocent days. In fact, the Holy Rabbi Isaac Luria said that whatever power a person has in his or her allotted years on earth, he may live to 95, the power that you have on any time in your life comes only from these precious days, from the days of youthful innocence, before there was any taste of sin. So even though every person is destined to fall from that pedestal of innocence, we're human after all, there is yet in every person something from before the sinning on which he or she can draw. So don't lose hope. All right, we can take this down now. I appreciate that. Now look, this is a stunning teaching for several reasons. So one reason is there's more than a whiff of antinomianism in this teaching, right? A sense that the receiving of commandments somehow puts us at risk of losing something pure and innocent. It's a reflection on law giving that almost sounds like Paul's critique in the first century. A critique that has been so central to Christian thought who would ever expect to see this in a Hasidic text? The second reason I think it's stunning is because we've been conditioned to think of the Omer period the way Jewish caterers think of it. Days be clouded by remembrances of loss and defeat, there's mourning. Along comes Avram Mordechai and tells us that these days are so precious that they deserve to be lovingly counted, not to get past them, but to, to count the precious things that we have. But the third reason I think is the most important, and to highlight this exhilarating aspect of Avram Mordechai's teaching, I'm going to turn to a passage from a much more recent book, not written by a Jew at all, and not written with Shavuot in mind, but is expressing very much the same thing. So uh, once again to the screen, uh, if we could. So this is from uh, a book uh, from 2018 by the 
uh, very the towering figure in the environmental world, uh, Bill McKibben. Uh, the book is called Falter. And look what he says here. In our current culture, we find the idea of maturing less exciting than the idea of growth, because I think in our own lives, maturation is bittersweet. When we were young and growing, we could do and choose anything. No options had been foreclosed. Maturity means making choices to commit to one person, one career, one community. If we admire individuals for those traits, it's possible we can learn to admire societies for the same things. Now, I want to ask to focus on for the first three lines here before we get to the end of that passage. When we were young and growing, we could do and choose anything. No options had been foreclosed. We can take this down now, um, please. This, he's talking about this incomparable psychology of youth, which is really what Avram Mordechai is talking about. This unfettered imagination that you see in children. Parents and educators know this very well. It's an imagination that's born of the sense that anything is possible. And this is what the period between the Exodus and Sinai was for us as a people in this really beautifully evocative, evocative reading of Avram Mordechai. We had crossed the birth canal that was represented by the split sea, and we came to the other side with this pure potential that newborns have, an unconquerable energy. And this is in the Hasidic teaching we've looked at, this is what the Omer means for us each year as individual human beings. Every time it comes around, of course, we're a year older by definition. And so we're once again in need or even more in need each year of being reminded of that enthusiasm of youth, of being reminded of an enthusiasm that refuses to accept that our imaginings are by definition impossible. We are in each year of our relentless aging. We are in need of drawing as he puts it on that spirited residue that is always there within us. And I ask you, isn't this what we as parents should always want for our children? Isn't this what we as teachers should always want for our students? And in fact, isn't this what we as adult aging humans should always want for ourselves? To be able to reach back and recapture that sense of, there's no horizon that automatically hems me in. There is always the possibility of breaking new ground. But now the question is, what else is there that we need to keep us human? Yeah, we need that youthful energy. We need to recapture that innocence. Well, the other, that other thing that we need to keep us human is what McKibben begins to point to at the end of that segment that we just read. There are things to be said in praise, not only of the precious days of unbounded youth, there is something to be said in praise of the celebration of law-giving that Shavuot came to represent. In fact, the praise of Sinai and its law impresses itself on us today, not just for the obvious Jewish reasons, but for far more universal human reasons. And it's here that I want to take a moment or two to revisit a very well-known defini redefinition, redefinition, really, of what true strength and might is. So if we could put up the screen again, and this time we'll keep it, we'll keep it up for a few minutes after, um, after we read the next text. So this is from Pirkei Avot, the beginning of chapter four, well-known Mishnah, um, where Ben Zoma gives us some redefinitions of different qualities, uh, chokhma, gvura, and osher. Um, he's really riffing, Ben Zoma's riffing on Jeremiah, who said we shouldn't take pride in any of these things. Al yitalel gibor bigvurato. Don't take pride in power, where power means how much you can bench press. Ben Zoma redefines what power is and says, you want to take pride in power? This is the power that you should take pride in. Ben Zoma liked to say, Ezehu gibor hakoveshet yitzro, one who can overcome one's inclinations. I would almost, I would rather translate yitzro as his yetzer, his, your constitution, which is really what yetzer means. As it is said, tov moshel beruchom milocheid ir, from Proverbs, one who rules over his own spirit is better off 
than one who conquers a city. All human beings may be constitutionally constructed to do many things. We're human, we, we're curious, we're adventurous. We wanna draw on that reservoir of youthful dreams of conquest. But the person to be admired, says Ben Zoma, is one who nevertheless chooses to refrain from those conquests that are going to prove to be destructive. That's Hakovesh et Yitzro. And the, the next text there from Bahia ibn Pakuda, who was the great Spanish moralist of the eight, 11th century, um, illustrated it with this little tale. It is said of a pious man, and by the way, there's a little dispute about this, but some say that there is actually a hadith in the uh, Islamic tradition that is almost exactly parallel to this. It is said of a pious man who met some men returning from a war against enemies. They brought spoils after a raging battle, material goods that were going to enrich them. And he said to them, you've returned from the small war with spoils. Now prepare for the big war. And they asked, what big war? And he answered, oh, it's the war of the Yetzer and its legions. What are you going to do with this victory? Is it going to be self-aggrandizement? What are you going to do with those spoils? What is it going to do to your life? How are you going to deal with the other conquests that you uh, yearn for that may not be so justified? So uh, this uh, combined with Benzoma tells us something about the importance of restraint not to throw away that youthful reservoir, but to understand that it can't be followed always unqualifiedly because we have to be aware of other things that are about our humanity and about our world. We can take this text down now. So Falter is not a cheerful book. It's sobering inasmuch as it rehearses for us all that the author has, to, has had to say for years, those who have followed McKibben, He's had to say for years about the dire peril to the Earth's ecosystem that we have allowed to proceed with precious little check. But what makes this particular book distinctive in, in his oeuvre is that it's not merely about environmental sins, not that they're mere. It's more broad, broadly about what he calls the human game, or perhaps you might want to call it the human project or perhaps even more theologically, and I like this, God's human gamble. I like the word gamble here because it, gets, it connects to an image that McKibben paints for us. McKibben suggests that the way that we have relentlessly and exuberantly pursued our technological capabilities and pursued those advances reminds him of a person who has had a hot hand in a casino, a remarkable winning streak, yeah, there are temporary setbacks. They're more than made up for by doubling down on the next bet. But how long can that hot hand continue? How long can we continue to ignore what seems to be the cold fact that limitless growth and limitless consumption can surely not be sustained indefinitely? And is there anything inside the gambler that can get her to decide to stop the betting? Is there a Benzoma inside of all of us? to consolidate and begin to maintain the winnings in order to support and to sustain life. He has in mind the relentless collection and usage of data, the end game of which no one can truly predict. He has in mind autonomous vehicles and autonomous weapons of war, artificial intelligence, gene editing and designing through CRISPR-Cas9 technology and a host of other ingenious tools that for all of their amazing advances, and they do bring many beneficial advances with them, for all of that, they are at the same time threatening to make unprecedented and irreversible changes in what it is to be human. As our species, led by our own prosperous and resource-rich nation, pursues that natural youthful exuberance of pushing through and past every previous limit on our prowess, the history of technology should remind us that unfortunately, whatever can be done 
will almost certainly in the end be done. And what are we going to do about that? What could bring about a break? It's admittedly an improbable break, but what could bring about a break in this pattern? So it's here that McKibben lets us in on what he calls an outside chance, those are his words, for saving God's human gamble. Uh, by the way, I'm not attributing theological language to him. He actually is a religious person and appeals to theological language himself. But let's put up the next text, uh, if you would. We're back to McKibben here, where he says something really very, very important. Societies are measured not just by the things they build, but also by the things they can bring themselves to leave alone. Whales, bright plumed birds, mountains, children kept safe from Dickensian labor. None of these fights is easy. But in a world where algorithms are starting to take over, where Facebook and Amazon know us much too well, these self-imposed limits help keep us human. And then he says, the most curious of all lives are the human ones because we can destroy but also because we can decide not to destroy. The turtle does what she does and magnificently. She can't not do it though. Any more than the beaver can decide to take a break from building dams or the bee from making honey. But if the bird's special gift is flight, ours, our special gift is the possibility of restraint. We are the only creature who can decide not to do something that we're capable of doing. That's our superpower. Get back to Ben Zoma, right? Jeremiah, Al Yitalel Gibor Bigvurato and Ezehu Gibor from Ben Zoma. That's our superpower, even if we exercise it too rarely. Okay, we can take this down again. I thank you so much for uh, promptly doing that. There is no lack of love here in, um, in McKibben's uh, exposition, no lack of love for the human species or lack of awe at what we're capable of. But what he's truly in awe of is that last thing he says, we're the only creature who can decide not to do that with something that we're capable of doing. This is the superpower that was offered to us symbolically as Jews but it has to be offered to all of humanity. It was offered to us on Shavuot at Sinai. It's embodied in the law of the 10th commandment. Lo tachmod, you shall not covet. You shall restrain yourself and you shall wield the great superpower of compassionate restraint that you as a human being have been given. And it is embodied in the commandment to acknowledge God and to love God because to love God means to love and care for what God most loves. And God is, and we say this every day in our tefillot, mirachem al ha'aretz umirachem al habriot. God has deep love and compassion for the earth and for its creatures, especially the human ones. If we deface the earth and the very nature of humanity, we will have committed the ultimate desacralization of the world. So I'm gonna have one more text that I'd like you to put up now. It's a little postscript uh, on the project of life extension. Uh, can we put that last one up? Thank you. Uh, some of you may have seen two weeks ago in the Sunday Magazine, New York Times, there was a whole, whole issue there, that magazine on life extension in longevity. And, uh, and McKibben had something to say about this in that book as well. Michael West, who organized the first effort to isolate human cells for cloning purposes, was once asked whether immortality wouldn't lead to overpopulation. We're not talking really about immortality. Um, Yuval Harari, I think he may have coined this word, amortality. You can still die in war or accidents, but the people who can afford it will be able to extend their lives through organ transplants, through artificial means, and they will just live forever. But it'll be the people who afford it. So he's asked, won't it lead to overpopulation? He said, sure, he said, but why put the burden on people now living? 
people enjoying the process of breathing, people living and being loved? The answer is clearly to limit new entrants to the human race, not to promote the death of those enjoying the gift of life today. So let's push ahead with this and extend life indefinitely and just stop having children. McKibben says it's that incredible self-absorption that should be the clue to what a bad idea this all really is. Though the technologists at some level value individual humans too much, because no one can be allowed to die, they value humanness far too little. They don't understand that some sadness and loss is not just bearable, it's essential. It's what it means to be human. There's an everyday heroism, if you think about it, in bringing up your children fully aware that they're going to supplant you because that's what human civilization is. If it weren't, if your children were just going to be other beings who perpetually trailed you through infinity by 20 or 30 years, then the most powerful of human connections would in effect be severed. A world without death is a world without time. And that in turn is a world without meaning at least human meaning. Go far enough down, down this path and the game is up. Okay, we can take this down and I wanna wrap this up now by going to a Midrash. There is a Midrash on the moment of Sinai on Shavuot that tells us that when Israelites said, Na'asev v'nishma, we will heed and we will do, God said to the angel of death, you no longer have any dominion over this people. This was not a promise of immortality to individuals. This was a promise of the endurance of the nation. If they truly live by the constraints that law and ethics provide. It is the seemingly paradoxical freedom that's embodied in the well-known reading in Pirkei Avot chapter 6 that Harut al-Haluchot carved into the tablets should possibly and properly be read as cherut al haluchot. There is freedom on the tablets. What is that freedom? I said at the very beginning, my goal was to, to illustrate how Shavuot is a second festival of freedom. What is this freedom? The wordplay tells us that Shavuot does indeed complete the first festival of freedom with a freedom of its own. It is the freedom from the compulsion to do everything that it is in our power to do. That's what every lo ta'aseh in the Torah is ultimately about. Whether you agree with the particular one or not, the enterprise of saying lo ta'aseh at all is that way of domesticating that essential enthusiasm of youth that we always have to hold on to, but that has to be uh, reined in from time to time. It's the freedom of the compulsion to do everything that it's in our power to do, even if it threatens to bring an end to God's gamble on humanness. That's what's stylized here as the angel of death. That compulsion is the angel of death. And when we said Naasev and Ishma, we were told the angel of death, if you stick to this, will not have a power over you. We will endure we can endure if we embrace that freedom from the angel of death that was offered to us at Sinai. So we, uh, we end here. I think that's just about 28 minutes and uh, wishing everybody Chag Sameach. Thank you for one after minute. I forgot to give you the five minute reminder. That's okay. Uh, we actually have uh, one, <coughs> one, one <laughs> we have one minute, one minute left. I guess, uh, um, first of all, absolutely beautiful and love how you uh, frame it with Nasebi Sean, how like uh, I'm also thinking about laws really just giving us the direction, sort of like, you know, on a highway, not everybody can go 100 miles an hour or 20. So it you know, lets us know. Um, I guess in, in, in a minute that we have, if you were uh, in a position of secular power right now, um, you know, thinking about our media companies, Amazon, Google, whatever, like where should we put the brakes on, on innovation? Well, I don't know exactly where we should put the brakes, but I think that there are, um, there are conversations that are certainly not happening in, in full view that, sh that need to be happening. If they're happening behind closed doors, we may not know. But, uh, but people who are thinking in the terms that you've seen here, um, ethicists, philosophers, um, theologians, 
uh, people who have um, a perspective on the human condition that is not simply, you know, the the Elon Musk uh, perspective on, you know, how how far out into the solar system can we get, and you know, what technologies can be uh, can be advanced. Uh, those conversations have to be happening with an urgency, and um, and they have to uh, try to draw that line. But that there needs to be some line seems to me an uh, you know, a pshita. It's a just a, otherwise. Uh, I don't think anyone can predict what this uh, what this human gamble is going to uh, end up being. Thank you. Um, really, uh, um, we're going to buy uh, Bill and Kibben's book and hopefully be able to use it um, this summer. So, Chag um, Sameach. And, uh, and one of these days, I hope to get back to the Rockies. Please, God, as soon as COVID is over, we can welcome people back. You are on right. our list. Of, uh, <laughs> please return. We'll go for another bike ride. Okay. Um,